Hello and welcome to another edition of Penniston Talks, the programme that puts local people on a pedestal and we find out a little bit more about their life story and their achievements. Today's guest was a FIFA referee and after retirement uh, became the general manager of the PGMOL. I'd like to welcome Keith Hackett. Keith, welcome. Thanks Steve, delighted to be on the show. Uh, we'll start off um, with your achievements in, in a while, but uh, you were born in 1944. Gr growing up in Sheffield in the late 40s and, and early 50s, would you say it was a tough childhood? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I sometimes say to the grandkids, look, uh, there were times when I went to Hillfoot School, which was a walk, uh, quite a distance from where I lived, uh, having to put cardboard in my shoes to cover the holes in the shoes. Really? I mean, it's quite remarkable when you think back how life has changed. Uh, and sometimes, the one thing that my parents always uh, did with my uh, two brothers and sister was, was to feed us. Yeah. They, they fed us really well. Uh, and at Christmas we all, all got uh, great, great toys and all those sort of things. But uh, during the course of the week, um, I think uh, life was difficult in terms of going to school. Um, you know, it, it was a small school, everybody knew each other, we got on well, we played football. In fact, going from home to school every morning, that was a game of football because every door, and there were lots of them, yeah. were goals. Yeah. And then we'd finish up counting and you'd be 36, 33, something like that, yeah, to yeah. score. Uh, but with a tennis ball. And then it was who owns the tennis ball. And then you had the other thing to ensure that if there are dogs about, you pick the wall up and you walk for a bit, otherwise they'd grab it and off they went. We ain't got time to chase, yeah. to chase the dog for the ball. I mean, yeah. talking of football, you, you were born into a, a family of owls as opposed to a family of blades, weren't you? I mean, did, did you get a chance to see Sheffield Wednesday when you were a child? Yes. Um, my dad used to walk us to the ground. Uh, he was a steel worker. He worked really hard, you know, hot sheet roller. Used to go and watch him do his job at the bottom of the road. It was, it was incredible when, when I think back. Really physical. He had three sort of things that he did in his life. Pigeons, he was a great pigeon fancier and, and very successful. Uh, he obviously loved the garden. You know, at times we would go to his two greenhouses, sit there with a bag of salt, believe it or not, pull the tomatoes off the plants and eat them with fresh bread and butter. <laughs> yeah. And then he'd take us to, to the stadium. And there's one story that I always reflect because we used to walk to the ground, it's about three miles. On the way he'd stop and have a, a couple of pints or more. I'd get a bottle of orange, a packet of crisps, and then off we'd go to the ground. Uh, he always stood on the cop at Hillsborough, and, uh, and being fairly small, I would be lifted up, put on the, the tops of, of spectators' heads, if you like, yeah, yeah. And, and ski slope almost to the front, where I'd be at the wall, uh, standing on a cardboard box to be able to see over the wall behind the goal. Um, and, you know, without going too far forward, uh, my biggest achievement I felt in my career as a referee was in 1979 when I got a call to tell me from the FA that I was going to referee Liverpool Arsenal at Hillsborough in the FA Cup semi-final. Where we lived at Parkwood Springs, which was a tough area, all the, the terrace houses had been raised to the ground and the, you know, they, they, they were obviously talk about ski slopes and all that yeah, goes yeah. with it. Um, and I just decided to drive the company car, park it up, and with my bike and my blazer and tie, because that's what you had to do, yeah. you, you are representing the FA. I walked to the ground, I walked that distance. I didn't call at the pub. And when I got close to Hillsborough, one or two people recognized me and said, hey Keith, thought you were refereeing the match. And I, I am, what are you doing then? <laughs> Walking to the pitch. Yeah. And, and you know, walk, running down the tunnel and just going onto the green bit of Hillsborough, having been a spectator there, was just like incredible. It was the sort of sense of feeling was much better there than I had when I did the cup final in '81. Uh, and was it an emotional journey for you? Because you're following the yeah. footpaths you did with with your with your dad, and 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 and, 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 and the, but the, the end result for you was the big game rather than watching the match. It must have been an emotional journey that one. Yeah, it was because you s first of all. I'd not officiated at Hillsborough yeah. ever, and so it was a completely new experience. Um, and you suddenly realise the pitch and the slope and the size of it, and it was quite, 
you know, tough physically to run from the cop end yeah. to Leppings Lane. Yeah, yeah. It was a slope that, that took a bit out of you. But, you know, I just was on the crest of a wave, really. It, it, it just the emotions took over, the, the adrenaline rush was there. Everybody tells me it was one of the most boring games ever. <laughs> it was a nil-nil draw and they went to a replay. But for me, um, it didn't matter about the result. It didn't really matter about the teams. I, I was actually on that pitch. Yeah. Uh, that I'd, I'd been there as yeah, a boy. Yeah. I'd seen my hero, uh, Derek Dooley, you know, big ginger head centre, centre forward, hitting the back of the net. Uh, sadly, Derek lost his leg uh, in an accident at Preston North End. You know, he broke a leg, gangrene set in, he had it amputated. Uh, he was my hero. And th the one thing that I was always pleased about was when I first met Derek, I couldn't believe it because there was a knock on my door. I was refereeing at Norton Wood Seats on a Sunday morning and in stepped George McCabe, who was then a FIFA referee, and Derek Dooley. And I've, I'm like looking at Dooley. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly glazed eyes. I'm the, I'm the guy in front of the toy shop and I'm going, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he just shook my hand and said, really well done. And, and then there was a, a, a form of relationship because every time then I bumped into Derek, we would always have a banter. We'd always... Uh, if you like, enjoy that conversation, be that at Hillsborough. And then, of course, when he was fired on Christmas Eve, which we all thought was a horrendous decision by the board at Sheffield Wednesday, eventually he finished up at Sheffield United, where he became the CEO. Always welcoming, a guy, a guy of the people, really. Yeah, yeah. And very, very knowledgeable about football, and very knowledgeable about refereeing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he didn't hesitate coming forward uh, in terms of referees' performances, uh, but at the same time, you, you could have a discussion with him to put the referee's view across. We'll talk more about your career uh, later, but I want to go back to your school days now. And uh, I mean, Were you a sport-minded person or were you academically minded at school? Neither really, when I, when I think back. I mean, I, I, look, I enjoyed playing sport, so we played cricket. I wasn't, you know, I fringed the school football team, yeah. but we had some really good players. Yeah. You know, Jack Fowler, the centre half, finished up at Chesterfield Football Club, and 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 others. Um, so it was a good school team, and uh, and occasionally I got in. I, I think I made the numbers up more than anything <laughs> yeah, else. Yeah. In truth, um, did you want to be a footballer? Was that your dream when you was a child? Yes, I think uh, I think everybody's dream was how do you. How do you get out of the uh, the sort of area of poverty to some degree? Yeah. Although it was poverty not like you see in Africa, but poverty in terms of uh, recognition. I think the great thing was that I never had a chip on my shoulder because of that. Everything was about ambition yeah. and focus. And I can remember, you know, uh, when I was, I mean, during that school, uh, period. We we as a school moved to Chaucer because you know, Chaucer school took all the teams and and I I went to Chaucer. I failed the eleven plus, but then they had this uh, uh, examination to go to the technical school in Sheffield. I passed that. Everybody was happy. The yeah. school was happy. Parents were delighted. I lasted two weeks. I bottled it. And if I'm really honest, the people that were there weren't the people that I was used to yeah. living with, yeah. dealing with, talking with. A different sort. It was a posh end of, yeah, of yeah, the yeah. sit town yeah. and, and therefore as a result, I found it difficult, particularly one, one particular lesson when they started talking Latin and, and saying Latin's gonna be the subject, I've gone, that's not for me. And so I pulled out of that. Um, but you know, I worked hard, I, I always had this, um, scenario in my life, I still have it today, and I think it comes from my parents, that if you start something, you've got to finish it, but you then become very industrious. And so, you know, when I look back, you know, when I, I joined a company as a, an apprentice engineer, Hallamshire Steel, where my dad worked, um, I put in a great deal of effort. And when, when I look through that period of going to night school, getting my GCO levels and, and maths and, and passing my city and gills. Um, that was putting in a day shift and then, 
you know, four nights a week. And then when I reached 16, 17, I became a referee. You so know. my next question to you was going to be after school. Did you follow the education path or did you go into a working environment? But it sounds like you did both. I did both. Uh, and uh, I think that it, it, the day is 24 hours long and some yeah. people only gain eight hours of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. For me, you know, I was up six o'clock this morning. I'm up at six o'clock most mornings and I'm probably 11 going, going to bed maybe a little bit later on occasions. And in that time, um, you know, when I, when I look back at a career that took me into sales because, you know, I became um, in charge of the drawing office at Hallamshire Steel. We had 21 draftsmen um, and I'm in charge of them. They, they were guys who were 45, 50, yeah, yeah. 60 yeah, and yeah. I'm, I'm like 21. And was it your ambition and your drive and your commitment that got you into that position, do you think, at such an early age? Yes, it was, because I think it was more than a job. I mean, if I told you that, I, I can remember knocking on the managing director's door and saying, I think that in this steelworks we should encourage people to play sport. And he said, well, you'd say that because you referee local football. And I go, well, I think more people could benefit from it. And out of that, we got an arrangement where every employee it was docked sixpence out their pay. They all agreed to it. They could actually pull out if not. And we finished up buying a sports field at, at uh, four lane ends and uh, the other side of Sheffield and, and created a football team. That's almost like starting a sports and social club, isn't it? Well, that's what it became. But then when, you know, so that was 20, 19, 20, 21. When I got 21, um, I had to join a union. Mm -hmm. You know, they, that was, they came to me and said, you've got to join a union. I go, well, just a minute. I'm not sure I want to join a union. And they go, no, you've got to join a union. I go, okay, okay, fine. And I joined the union, the Draftsman and Allied Technicians Association. And then I got this uh, letter from them, which said, what do you do? What specific tasks do you do? How much do you earn? And of course, I think I earned about 17 quid a week, mm. something like that. Mm. And I got this letter back saying the data Draftsman Allied Technicians Association rate at 21 is 21 pounds. And I've gone, wow. So I, I can remember taking that letter to someone who I admired, the managing director, and said to him, look, I've received this letter. I want you to read it. And I'm being informed that I should be earning at least 21 pounds. That's the rate. And the, and the guy goes, no way, absolutely no way. I go, well, listen, I'm in charge of the, the, the office and there's people earning much more money than me. Oh, it's an age thing. You haven't been here that long. And I'm going, well, I'm taking the responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had this debate, which he then said, well, go away and come back in a couple of days' time and we'll have a, com a further conversation. I went back in a couple of days' time and the guy said, look, we've, I've given it great consideration. Um, I'm going to give you 10 shillings a week rise as though it was the earth that I was being given. I've gone, sorry, it's 21 pounds. And he goes, well, we are not going to meet that expectation. And Even I though people below you were a mom. Though. Absolutely. And I said, well, OK, fine. Um, can I inform you? And I grabbed a piece of paper. That this is a petulance that I don't have any longer, but I had then, which is part of youth, isn't it? And I said, have you got a piece of paper, Mr. Loss? And he gave me a piece of paper and I just wrote, I quit handed it to him and walked out and and I can remember that Friday and Saturday well Friday night was hell at home I mean my dad was not happy and he went on and on and on and he and I'm trying to escape to go to the pub no chance because he's telling me what I've done wrong and I've got to go back on Monday and apologize we bought the star newspaper that night and I'm looking through it and there's an ad for a draftsman at, at a, a, a metal windows company, Mellows, in, in, uh, in Sheffield. And it says, design draftsman, uh, salary in excess of. And I've got, that's even better than what I'm earning. And yeah, I yeah. phoned up that Saturday morning, went to the telephone box. You know, we didn't have mobile yeah, yeah. phones. Phoned up, put the money in. And the guy said, can you come round? And I went, I went uh, to see him that morning. Um, sat there and he said, look, 
can't give you probably what you're expecting to get because you know you you've still got some experience to, to gain yeah um, but we'll start off at 24 pounds and I'm now beaming because I've accepted the job I'm almost off the chair <laughs> and uh, and, and he said, look, let, start in a couple of weeks' time. I said, well, I'd like to start Monday. He goes, well, we've got all the paperwork. I'll come in on Monday. I'll do it for nothing, just to get out of the house. <laughs> and, and that's how, you know, things started. And when I moved from that company to become a sales guy, and my refereeing career was running in parallel, you know, um, I think people have got to understand that um, the toughness of referees you know, the conflict that you have to deal with, you know, uh, 12 years. I refereed for 12 years at grassroots level. Um, Talk about when you started refereeing, because that was 1960, wasn't it, when you first started yes, in Sheffield? Was. Yeah. I mean, what happened was the, the county FA had said, I played for a, a, for a team at Crimica Lane, which is forward end of Sheffield, believe it or not, where they all spoke pretty posh. <laughs> and I'm I'm sort of playing for this team, and then they, we got in. The team started getting into our problems, and out of it came the FA saying, "One of your players must come and take a referee's examination." And um, I was the guy that was volunteered, so I took the exam, no intentions of refereeing. And by the way, it was free. So it was just fluke then that you were you were volunteered that you actually got into refereeing. Absolutely, I mean, well. I passed the examination, we took a verbal and written examination, I passed that and I had no intention of refereeing and then on one particular Friday I took a phone call at work and it was Kangley here, I didn't know who Kangley was, he was the secretary of the county FA, Kangley here, you're refereeing um, Hillsborough Boys Club versus Sheffield United Juniors, put the, pho put the phone down. I hadn't got the time to say no, <laughs> uh, we hadn't got a game. Um, I borrowed a shirt, uh, I had to buy a whistle, I borrowed a, a watch um, and walked out onto the field at Intake School, Cadman Road. Um, refereed a football match, I don't know how it went. I mean, th the only thing I can say is there was a guy called Len Swallow, who I later understood was his son was a football league linesman and he was with Sheffield United Juniors. And he came up to me after the match and said, that was really well done. It was great to have an experienced referee. I've gone, this is my first match. Yeah. <laughs> and I think he was as shocked as, as probably I was in that sense. But all of a sudden then, somebody's actually telling me, hey, you're pretty good at this, and I've only done it once. So I then need to do it again and again and again. But that must have filled you with confidence for your first game and then to have those comments. It did, uh, but I think that the, the world of refereeing then is completely different to what it is now. I think that youngsters coming into the game now, it's much tougher. I think there's a general acceptance of the guy in the middle. There was almost a, a line of authority. Yeah. Authority meant something. Yeah. And that to some degree has been eroded, but it's been eroded because education says, you know, you don't accept what the teacher's telling you 100% you absorb and then understand and try and explore with that teacher various scenarios. As a result, education has almost promoted the idea of questioning a decision. And of course that then escalates onto a football field where sadly on the rare occasions we see violence against referees. But we're seeing now um, an escalation of dissent, unacceptance of refereeing decisions at grassroots level, which is deemed often as banter, but for that youngster that's out there trying to learn his craft, might just be the, that negative comment that's made, might just be the, the, the tick that says, I'm no longer doing this, and that referee walks away from the game. And what drives the spectator to, to behave in that way? Do you think it's because of what they see on television, the commentators, the pundits, and, and the comments that they're making during commentating on a game, or is it just vent up frustration from the, the world that we live in today? Yeah, I think there's some. I think there's some frustration. I think that everyone, everybody wants Johnny or, or Lucy that's playing to be the very best. They the think that the they're the, wor yeah, the yeah. world's best. So the, the parents, you know, when I referee, we did, there was one man and a dog, 
and he, you, you, you kept looking to make certain he didn't disappear because <laughs> he was the yeah. secretary of the club that was going to pay you your fee. Yeah. You know, and and look, I've I've been through those situations where, you know, seven and sixpence is the fee, as then all money, and the guys come in and said you're not worth it, throwing it on the floor, and I've walked away from it, and then I've reported that club saying they didn't pay me my fee. The important thing to stress here, I think, is you had a full time job at the time, didn't you? And Absolutely. and this was a part. It was just a part time job, wasn't it? Oh. Or was it a hobby? It, throughout my career, it's it's a hobby that gets you get paid for, but you've got to understand that you know there's there's huge amounts of stories that that I could tell. I, you know, I mean, I mean, I can remember being a director of a company, and, and I'm jumping it, and I'll go back, but I can remember um, leaving the work at four o'clock in Sheffield and stepping on to Highbury at, 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 in London at, at eight o'clock, quarter to eight for a kickoff. And don't tell me what I did to get there. <laughs> yeah. I can remember uh, I'd lost a job through refereeing, I might get into that later on, um, because I, I was refereeing New Zealand v Australia in a World Cup match. I got permission and then they rescinded that when I was in New Zealand. I mean, it was a way of getting rid of me, clearly. Yeah. But I'd been a sales director at that company, and the, the, when I started as sales director there, there were three million turnover. And when I left, we were 104 million turnover. So I think I could say that I was a pretty successful sales yeah. guy. But they they, they changed your management, changed your style, they wanted me out. Um, but shortly afterwards, I was re-employed them as a director of a company in Sheffield. And we were due a board meeting, and. I got a call from UEFA saying, look, we've got a really big, difficult match here, Keith, that we want you to officiate. Stuttgart versus Feyenoord, and we're really concerned about whether it will complete its 90 minutes. And I said, OK. And then the board meeting was called, and I went in and sort of pleaded for permission. They said, well, look, we'll delay the board meeting until the afternoon Remembering that you fly out Tuesday, referee Wednesday, come back Thursday, uh, holiday, um, taking off your holiday days. And I can remember that I was, the flight that I was scheduled to come back on on the, on the Thursday would, was going to get me back into the UK at five o'clock. And the only way back was for me then to pay a couple of grand to charter an aircraft to fly myself back at my cost. So. When, when you actually... This is for the sake of a part-time job, right? Where you've obviously got that commitment and dedication that it's so serious that you pay that money yourself. Well, it's, it, you know, to get to the international panel, we had to be in the top three referees for a, a minimum of three years. So you're working at, at Football League Division 1, 2 and 3 and 4, and every game counts. Every, you know... People used to say to me, even in the local park, down at Penniston, when I refereed here occasionally, they'd say, it's not the cup final, Keith, but it was, <laughs> yeah. and it is. Yeah. And so it's pride. It's pride. It's almost like a disease. But then you tell me there's fans traveling across the country today to watch their team, and they don't miss a match. Football is a disease in, in that sense, but it's also... And you get back to what you, we were talking about earlier. It is a it is a, a an opportunity for a spectator to actually just enjoy themselves, relax from the pressure of everyday life, and almost go into a cocoon where they're with friends. They can have a pint. They can have a cup of tea. They can have a view. And everybody's got a view on the game. I've yeah. got a view on the, yeah, on yeah. the game. So 1960 was your, your first refereeing game. In 1972, you were officiating in the Northern Premier League, but this time it was as, as a linesman. I mean, how, how, how did it switch from referee to linesman? Well, that's what we did. You know, uh, right throughout my career, uh, you, you, would, you would effectively move up the, the pyramid from... Uh, so I'm, I'm effective... I, I'm, if you like, Yorkshire League linesman. Then I became Yorkshire League referee. And then Northern Premier League, when it was formed, I was a linesman. Then I became a referee. And immediately then I became a referee, you then get nominated for the, for the Football League. 
So in that period of a, a short spell on the line in the Northern Premier League, which was a tough league, uh, you know, this, this was the difference. Here was I, I'd refereeing Stocksbridge Works in the Yorkshire League and it was all, all nice, okay, steel workers yeah, giving yeah. you a bit of stick, yeah. but really enjoyable. Uh, the only thing at Stocksbridge that you had to be take very great care about wasn't the players, wasn't the secretary, it was the groundsman because he took great pride in, in the, uh, the pitch. And I, I can remember on one occasion he came on and thumped a player who was making a line <laughs> outside the penalty area. The Yorkshire League was, was a good league, good competition, but all of a sudden I'm now going over the other side. I'm going to Altrincham, Mattlesfield, Northwich, Victoria, Stafford, uh, and they're getting paid. And they're getting paid a reasonable amount of money and the old attitude started to change. It was great grounding for me uh, ahead of getting onto the Football League. And you, in 1975 you made it onto the supplementary list of referees, didn't you? Yes. And then 76, a year later, you put on the full list. I mean, what, what, what was the progress and the process to progress it from, from one to the other in such a short space of time? Well, uh, you, you knew that you were going to get about eight games, ten maximum, in that season as a supplementary li list. And at referee. what level was this? What? Well, um, in that time, you were, the, the on, there were only three classifications of referee, one, two and three. You started off at three and you gained to one. So you would have a referee refereeing at, at Penniston Church, class one referee, that same referee, uh, not same referee, but a, another referee with the same classification would be refereeing at football league level. So I was class one. And so, you know, I got that call um, and I mean, I, I can remember my first game was Stockport County against Northampton and, uh, you know, you, you sort of, it's got to go well. You're under a great deal of pressure, but you don't feel that pressure. Pressure, in fact, you convert to concentration, effort. Uh, you knew that you had to work hard. The biggest problem that I found in that particular match was concentration because I was under the flight path of Manchester Airport oh, yeah. and every so often overhead almost touching you could touch was the airplane going into Manchester that was a distraction you learned very quickly that you had to keep your eyes on the game but also you were you were then performing in, on a real platform weren't you because you've gone from performing in front of a crowd of maybe 20 30 people watching a local grassroots game to thousands of people watching their pride and joy. Absolutely, and of course, uh, I mean, what, what is amazing, how, how quickly that, that, that comes, because I had a first division match that year. And so you're walking out uh, in, a, a, in a, a really big environment. Then the following year, I can remember going to Anfield, and, and like I'd been there as a linesman, and all of a sudden now as the referee. And treated slightly differently. Uh, people coming to you rather than mm -hmm. the guy sat in, 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 in this corner. Um, but you, you talked earlier about being in charge of, or supervising the draftsman uh, as a young lad, supervising people with years of experience. But you got on the full list of referees at 32 yeah. years of age. Yes. I mean, that, that's, again, it's another young lad in, in what was a, an old man's environment I th really, I wasn't think, it? I think that a lot of people were surprised because at that stage I was one of the youngest ever. Um, and I think in fairness it, it, it really was a reflection of the amount of effort I, I, would, I was putting in. Um, I, I think people probably don't understand now because a lot of referees now get to the professional level and become detached from grassroots. I never did that. So, you know, I, 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 I mean, I can remember, I refereed West Germany versus Italy in the opening game of the Euros in 96. And the following Sunday, I, I'm refereeing Blackpool Taverners versus the Angel, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, at, the, at the bottom of Wheel Lane. And I, I think that's, that was my career. So I was a referee and it didn't matter whether it was a Sunday morning and I'm refereeing my son's team because the referee's not turned up or, or refereeing a, a Sunday league game or a Saturday game. I just wanted a referee. And um, at that level, was every game still a cup game? Absolutely. In your mind as you were playing the game? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, because 
you know, there's an expectation that comes on you that you set yourself. You want to be the best at something, then you've really got to work at it. And you've got to analyze your own performance very carefully. A lot of referees don't do it. I mean, when I eventually became the boss of the PGMOL, which again is, is something for the future, the detail analysis of a referee's performance was, was, if you like, the foundation on which I could improve the standard of officiating in England. So I knew the distances they covered. I knew the distance that they were from the ball at the point that they, every decision they made during the course of the game and where they were positioned and how far from the ball, uh, the speed profiles, their recovery rates. And so as a result, the old world, if you think about refereeing, the, the old world of refereeing um, it is, is dealing with perception rather than reality. Your view is different to my of a referee. When I'm making a view of a referee, a, a, a comment or a view on a referee's performance, there's years of experience and detailed analysis behind that that says, I think this referee's done well. And, and how he could avoid certain errors in the future. And the background to the PGMOL is an important part of your story. But uh, b before we get to that, let's just talk. I mean, from 1976, it was open season for you. You were, you were officiating um, FA Cup finals, charity shields. You were appointed a FIFA referee. Yes. I mean, th th there's, there's too many games to go into for a programme of this sort. But what would you say was the, the game that meant the most to you? Oh, I, I think lots. I mean, I, there's, you know, um, I, I mean, I can remember my first game at Anfield. I've touched on it just earlier. And running out. And, and in the opening five minutes, Kenny Dalgleish is unhappy with a decision. And he's given me a few expletives. And I'm not having that. <laughs> yeah. I'm really not having that. Remember, I've worked in the steelworks. So the F word was regular, but not allowed on the football field then. And I've gone, right, I'm not having that. And then Emily News comes up. England captain. And, and the, you know, you can be a bit glazed eyes. Crikey, this is Emily News, right? And he comes up and says, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm going, listen, he can't say that to me. If he says that again, I'm going to take real action. Oh, come on, referee. And then he gives me a bit of grief. And this is the youth part of an experience coming in. Because I've gone, right, I'm cautioning you. What's your name? Inexperience on your side? Yeah, because oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going... I'm cautioning you, what's your name? Yeah. And he looks at me as I'm off a planet <laughs> and I've gone, yeah. and he's gone, I'm the England captain. And I go, yeah, I want your name because that was the process then. I want your name. Are you kidding me? I go, no. He goes, have you not seen me on TV with Sue Barker? And I've gone, no. <laughs> what is it? I just want your name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caution you. And I've gone, H, and I, I'm saying it, H-E-M-L-I, and he's suddenly, cr I'm, I'm going, Emling, light the drink. <laughs> he, it's Emling, with a Y, use, and I go, that's all I want, your name. And it's funny then, because we developed a friendship over the years. You know, we'd have a cup of coffee, we'd sit at a football match occasionally when he came and lived in this part of the world. I used to refer him in charity matches. So the, there are things like that that count. The, the fact that I'm at Old Trafford and Joe Jordan had just come from Leeds United with Gordon McQueen and he catches the ball in, on his arms. And I've seen this on TV, match of the day before, and I'm going, that's a foul. But a lot of my colleagues disagreed, so I've given it. And, and Joe Jordan comes absolutely running up to me. He'd look fierce, his teeth out, and he's having a real <laughs> go. Yeah. And I've gone, Joe, you're banned from Stringfellas Nightclub. You get me? You're banned from Stringfellas Nightclub. And his, his mate, Gordon McQueen's come across. There's still that relationship. And McQueen says, what's going off, ref? And I go, I've told him, Gordon, I've told him he's banned from Stringfellas Nightclub. He goes, what? I said, he's banned from Stringfellas. You, you can be banned as well if you want. And he suddenly goes, are you Johnny Ackett's brother? And I go, yeah. He said, Gordon, 
it's John's brother. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Didn't have any problems before. But there, there are a myriad of stories that the game it's funny throws that up. It's a non-related football issue that gets the friendship going, isn't it? But the, the interesting thing is, this is a conversation you're having on the pitch with thousands of people are watching, but those people have no idea what's going on. Absolutely no idea. I mean, I can remember uh, there was a guy called Brian Orton. He, be, he became the assistant manager at Hull at some stage, but uh, he was a Luton Town player, and I'm refereeing him. And he's running, he kept running at the side of me and saying, come on, Keith, come on, Keith, I'll beat you, I'll beat you, I'll beat you. And I'm going, Brian, just get off my bike. And he's going, go on, go on, Keith. And like, so, and then he'd, he'd be doing almost a commentary. That's a foul, Keith, that's a cow. And I've gone, Brian, it, let me referee this football match. But he's in my space. I can remember receiving, because she had a report then from the match assessor. And the, the, the assessor's report read, I was disappointed that you failed to control the Luton number four, Brian Horton, who wanted to orchestrate how this game should be refereed, and you allowed him to do that. It was a million miles from what was going off yeah. between the two of us, yeah. but that's the picture you yeah, yeah. got. And therefore, you learn from that. You suddenly go, just a minute, the whole art of refereeing is about body language, and sometimes, almost out the side of the mouth, you can say, do that again, I'm going to get involved. Uh, on the fly. And I think this is the art of, of managing players. That, that sadly, you know, if I was reinventing the game and the changes that have been made to the game, I would take away from the referee the red and yellow cards and ban them. Because what it stopped referees doing is, is, is talking to players in the right manner. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, it becomes almost like a producer gun, you're dead, yeah. I've shot you, yeah. with no sort of explanation. And sometimes players, I feel, you don't want a, a lengthy dialogue, but they have a right. What have I done wrong? You know, you've pulled him or you've pushed him. And he yeah. might know that, but yeah. you're reinforcing it. Come on, get on with the game. I'm enjoying it. You know, George Best ran alongside me at Stoke City and... and uh, we were 25 minutes into the game, what was a difficult match, and it was difficult playing conditions. He was a brilliant player. He was coming to the end of his career, but he was brilliant. And he said, ref, ref. And I've gone, what, George? He goes, ref, call it off. It's a nightmare. You know, how long to go? I said, we've only played for 25 minutes. Oh, I've had enough of this. And, you know, the linesman said to me in the dressing room, you've just got to take a bit of care with George Best because I, I thought he was having a real go at you. And I go, no, we're exchanging a view. And, and quite often that was the, the case. Yeah. And you used to get a talker, you know, I mean. It's interesting that the officials that are working with you have that view, because I guess the people in the stands will be thinking that as well, but it's, it's, it's night and day away from wh what the conversation uh, well, really I, was. I mean, absolutely, because I think that the one thing that we had to develop as referees in that era was personality. We were all different. We all came from different backgrounds. But in reality, uh, you know, we were a facilitator, hopefully, of a good game. I, I say to this, this day, the best referees are the ones you don't see. Difficult for me, because I was six foot one, two, and a bit, bit weighty, but nonetheless, it's difficult to hide. There are other referees that were much better at that, but there, there are other referees with great one-liners, you know? Um, and, and I think that you, you pick up from that. But you've also got to recognise that in a crowd of 50, 60,000, I had to look at, peer across the pitch and look at something that was this big, yeah. that was red or yellow, yeah. and pick up the, the linesman's view. But we had a, we had a, wor a working relationship that I think is, is probably better then than it is now, despite the fact that you know, I'm the guy who introduced communication kits to refereeing around the world. At that point, rugby had it, and we didn't. And then I went to Twickenham, saw it in use, and I've, I've come back to the Premier League and I, I've knocked on Scudamore's door, the CEO, and said, I want, I want communication kits. It's going to cost about 300 grand. And he goes, if you think that's going to be benefit, beneficial to the game, you go ahead. And we did. And, you know, a couple of months into that, I was beginning to have fears that I'd done the right thing because when uh, referees ran out at Chelsea, and I, I was there one particular weekend, uh, 
observing the referee, a young referee, and, and he's refereeing and all of a sudden he stops and looks around and, and he's missed the decision. But he's got away with it. He's lucky to get away with it, a big decision. And I've gone in the dressing room at the end of the match and said, can you talk me through? I never said, this is what you should have done. Will you explain to me that decision? How did you come to that decision? And he said, Keith, I, I was completely lost. I suddenly got a call over the system. Could, I, could there be a taxi from Kensington High Street to Hoxford Circus? He's saying what? <laughs> over the communication kit. That I've got interference with, with a taxi firm. And so we had to then bring all the systems back, reconfigure them to, to get uh, ensure that they were encrypted against outside interference. But the other thing is, well, I mean, go back to your days when you're making those big decisions on the field, and you say you, just, you have to focus in on like a letterbox size situation with fifty, sixty thousand people, all experts in the crowd. Oh, absolutely. I mean, how, how, if you whether you get the the decision right or wrong in your mind, somebody else has got a different view. How do you deal with that? I think that confidence, not arrogance. You've got to sometimes look as though there's a degree of arrogance, but confidence is a thing. You've got to trust yourself, you know? And, th and this is about the work rate, about the effort. You're gonna make mistakes, for sure, but you park them immediately. If you start dwelling on an error, your game is lost. Your concentration's gone. It, you will go downhill li like a vertical drop. What you have to do is park it, uh, and sometimes, you'll recognise that, hey, they're telling you you've made a mistake. Yeah. I can remember running a line for a, a Welsh referee, Tom Reynolds. He, he was a great character. A lot of characters that I ran the line for in that period. And we were at Anfield, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep up. On the left wing, I'm trying to keep up with Steve Iway. Now, that's a nightmare. And he would constantly go on these long runs at, at real pace. He had some real pace. And I've given the corner kick decision. I always kicked it against the defender, it's gone out for a corner. Um, I've come round, we used to come round onto the goal line and we no longer do that, but that was the practice then. So I'm stood there and the referee, Tom Reynolds, has gone goal kick. And I've looked and I've gone, that's never a goal kick, it's a corner kick. And he's looking at me, he suddenly picks me up, he's missed my signal. And he goes, <laughs> corner. And then, in front of the cop, he's gone <laughs> <laughs> like that, and his body language. And it was the sort of personality, he got a great. And like, we came out of that stadium, and they're all coming up saying, can we have your autograph? That was great, that. All the, all the, That's the, a human the, effect, isn't it? Yeah, it was, and I, you know, you suddenly think, he's got that freedom and license to be able to do that. So Bobby Robson once said that the biggest regret in his career was that he didn't spend enough time with his family, because the job spent a lot of his time. I mean, did, did you fall into that category with the referee? Mm. And I, really, because it was a part-time job that took a lot of your time, whilst you were still holding a full-time job down. Did, did the family suffer? Absolutely, no question. Um, you, you've got to understand that when I was sales and marketing director for Henderson Doors, my office was in Romford in Essex, and I was spending a couple of days, sometimes three days a week, down in, in the London area. I, had, I traveled the entire country. So I was living out of a suitcase, you know. I, I can remember uh, I, I refereed the cup final in 81 and then in 82 I got asked by a guy would I write an article or discuss with him an article for the FA Cup programme in, in 82. He wanted the experience of an FA Cup final referee and, and I, I did that. Uh, I later found out the guy was actually uh, Frank Nicklin who was then had been the sports editor of the Daily Mirror. He was well recognised within the media. Uh, I didn't know him, but we did the we did the piece sat uh, at a pub uh, in Romford, and uh, a few months later he came back on and he, he he said that he'd he'd been ill, and that that had helped him get back into into the job that he was doing. Uh, would I be interested in writing a book? And uh, I sort of thought this is mad not got an O-level at school, um, and I was being asked to write a book. And when I look back, uh, that first book, uh, which I did around about 84, 85, something like that, um, I would drive to Romford 
setting off usually about six in the morning um, and sometimes earlier and uh, dictate the book on a, on a recorder on the dashboard. While you were driving? Whilst I was driving. Um, you know, and, and those in itself, there were times when, um, you know, I used to go through uh, Clumber Park effectively that way to get to the A1. Um, and the number of times I was stopped in that period of the minor strike. And so, you know, where are you going? What are you doing? And, and um, a, a very forceful approach, which I thought about very strongly because it was upsetting. It was upsetting to have your integrity questioned. Yeah, yeah. Stop and search. Yeah. I mean, this was a big car. This was a Ford Granada, expensive car. But they still wanted to take 45 minutes of my time going under the nets and are you drinking beer and all that? And I'm going, how stupid is this? <laughs> but what it, it did was, it sort of said, just a minute, I, in a way a referee is associated with a policeman enforcing the laws. I'm enforcing the laws of the game. They're enforcing the laws of the land. Am I coming across in the same way? And, and I, think it, I think that had a, that period of, of running through those, the, the minor strikes is, is, is quite amazing. I'll tell you a story. Um, there, was a, there was a guy, a, a Doncaster referee, who was a super guy, and he was a, he was a, a, a pit deputy. And he was on strike. So his only income was running the line. And I can remember on one occasion, they used to pay us the fee then. It didn't come through, through the bank draft. It, it was cash in hand. And I got the cash and handed it over to him. Um, Tony Topham, this lad, he's, he's sadly passed away. And he started crying, a grown man crying. And I, I, it really got home to me. And then he started opening up the difficulties of the debt was growing. You know, this is during the miners' strike. And, uh, and, and so we all gave, and a few other referees yeah. gave their fees and everything to help Tony. Tony had a, a, a friend who was Alan Seville, who was a, a referee from the Midlands, a football league referee. And Alan had done something similar. And Tony's view was, the next time you're refereeing at Donny, give us a call and we'll have a spot of lunch together in the middle of the miners' strike. Alan comes to Doncaster and knocks on Tony Topham's door. And Tony looks surprised. And he goes, I've come for that cup of tea and sandwich prior to the game. And Tony's hesitant and eventually says, have you got your car? He goes, yeah. And, and they took him to a soup kitchen and, and in a way, it sort of, Alan rang me and Alan sort of said, amazing that you know, I never thought, I just wanted to say hello yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm embarrassed by him having to take, take him to, to a, a soup, soup kitchen. kitchen. But hey, uh, those experiences, I think, in life uh, are more than refereeing. But they're, they're if you like, a, a catalyst, a conduit to refereeing and life as a whole because you're dealing with different players players of you know who are, uh, have not had a career in industry don't understand but others who do you know you retired from refereeing just before your 50th birthday didn't you and, and then became an assessor and then in 2004 you were asked to take on the role as the general manager of the pgmol the professional game match officials board which w was your brainchild the PGMOL, and, and, that, and that was a, an idea that took a, a part-time job of a referee and turned it into a full-time job. Why did it need to turn into a full-time job? What was the reasoning behind it? Well, I think my experiences of, of, of losing employment and the pension that went with it um, was, was something that said, that's the first thing. The old question of getting time off work was, was difficult. Uh, for people, it put extra stresses on referees. So from, from my point of view, the game was getting quicker. Remember that you retired automatically at 45 from FIFA, the international panel, and then 47 
was the retirement age on the Football League. And the Premier League was formed around that time of my, uh, before my retirement. And the Premier League asked me to stay on. And I, I said, okay, I'll do a year. Then they asked me to stay on for a further year to help establish the competition. And at that point, I then had a meeting with Sir Dave Richards. Dave Richards then, he was the chairman of Sheffield Wednesday, and said, look, I think we've got to move into the area of professional referees. The game is speeding up. The commitment for training has to be greater, although I did mine in the morning, um, and a great deal of sacrifice. But I was getting the rewards for that. You know, the match fee of 35 quid then. And so as a consequence, uh, there was no link. We, we didn't know whether we were going to have a game the following week or not. And, and when I was uh, out of employment, f having been, f uh, you know, having left the job at, at Henderson's for a, a couple of months, um, that's a telling time because you think, well, every, every available day they would give you a football match, but they didn't. So they didn't help that flow. And, I'm, and then so I'm thinking about exposure the need for professionalization. And I put forward the paper. Uh, I, I sort of showed it to Graham McCrell, Dick, Dick Chester before that. And um, it was eventually accepted. And um, I became the development manager part time of that organization because I didn't particularly want to run the organization. Um, I got a job of work, but I was happy to, to say, right, I'll come along and and help the process of uh, I improving the refereeing standards. Um, and it was an organization there where we, what we had to do was, of course, some people had good pensions. So people like, say, you know, we, we look back and take Howard Webb without giving too much personal information. Howard was a ser sergeant on the police force. He, he, he was a football league referee. Uh, and we wanted to make him professional. So the way we went about that, that my plan was, you're, you will be allowed 20 hours of work a week in your other employment. What that did was, it didn't put this additional cost on the, the company, the new company, by way of having to pay pension. And, and it worked. But, you know, I can remember sitting in front of Mike Dean, famous Mike Dean now, he wasn't then, and saying to Mike, Mike, I'm going to bring you on to the PGMOL as a professional referee. And he went, fantastic. Mike at that time was earning about £12,000 as a chicken plucker. <laughs> he would, he'd got a low-level job, not because of a lack of intelligence, to have the availability to referee football matches. He'd sacrifice the work against that. Uh, but turning it into a professional job, you weren't just giving them it wasn't going from £35 a week to a full-time salary. You introduced sports science, fitness. I, I, I mean, the, 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 trans, the transformation y y you made in the PGMO was, it, it was unbelievable, the, the difference, wasn't it, from where they were to where they went to? Yeah, what I, what I did was, in a way, was quite simple. I mean, in marketing, and I'm, that's my career, it was sales and marketing was my career. You, you know, if, if you're making, as we did, say, garage doors, you benchmark that product against your com competition to get a price point, to get a quality point, all it does. No different for, for kitchen cabinets, exactly the same. What's the trend? Is it wood or is it, is it painted surfaces? Uh, and for me, refereeing was no different. But what I did initially was to say, right, I need to, ref I need to benchmark a referee against a player. So I trooped to... Uh, and had discussions with Sam Allardyce. Every, everybody thinks Sal Allard Allard Allardyce is a guy who's the big boot centre off that we all used to see and recognise. Uh, but in effect, technically, he was extremely competent. And so was Arsene Wenger and others that I talked to as well. But Sam gave me an insight into how he was using sports science. Uh, and that was good enough for me. And I came away and said, right, OK, the first thing I'm going to do is employ a sports scientist full time, which we did. And we sat with him and I said, right, OK, what we want is to affect a lifestyle change in refereeing. We've got to meet the requirements because, you know, the requirements was the game had increased. And up to that point, every referee thought the training regimes were correct. 
because they're all aimed at endurance. Mm -hmm. Let's go out and run for 12 minutes or half an hour or whatever. Mm -hmm. We were marathon runners rather than actually sprinters, where the game would change mm -hmm. to dynamic sprinting. So, you know, how are we, we can't have these guys in every week like a football team, every day. Uh, that would be the ideal. So, we introduced Paula Hart uh, monitors. I mean, I had discussions with the then chairman of, of, of uh, Tudor Watches, Paula, and uh, they shaped the watch to give us the information. And it was, it was finite information. It, it gave us distances, speeds, recovery rates, all on a watch. And that once the, re once the referee had done that training session, he would couple that up to a laptop that we provided him with and a simple download to our sports science. So we could check every day what, it was four times a week, uh, the, the, the training regime that we'd set, whether in fact it accomplished it. And yeah, I'm, I'm tough now, because now I'm, I'm the, the guy that's got to deliver. Yeah. I'm the guy that's put my neck on the line. And this is probably why I'm critical now of current referees, because they don't understand the fight that I had to have and, and the process that we had to go through to get professional refereeing. And it was on the basis that if we have that investment, we would get that return. No yeah. different than a, a shop around the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And therefore, the whole element of refereeing is to deliver the very best performance. I will forgive a referee making an error if I see that he's made the effort to get from A to B yeah. and get in the right position. Yeah. And so, we knew that referees had to average 11 and a half thousand meters. We knew that, you know, when Henri went on a sprint, we knew that that was seven meters per second sprint, and he could sustain it for 50 meters. We needed to do the same. Yeah. And so we had checks and balances. We knew that people like Alzi, Webb, Clattenburg, and a few others could run from penalty area to penalty area in 11 seconds. And we needed, so we changed, if you like, from endurance uh, runners to dynamic sprinting. Yeah. And, and so the old uh, shape had changed. Um, and so with the electronic equipment, it's easy to say, well, OK, we've got a communication kit. But then everybody wants to referee the match, the linesman as well. So we had to start thinking about protocols. And so what I then started do, doing was then taking a game of football and breaking everything down into a process for a referee. So let, let me give you an example. There's a 10 yard free kick. There's a free kick being awarded. The first thing is hit the whistle so everybody hears it's a free kick. Now move to the position of where that incident took place if it's getting close to the penalty area. Take control of the ball. Now that doesn't mean you juggle with it. But actually, you put it down and you say to everybody else, don't touch this ball until I've blown a whistle or I've signalled. So you talked earlier in the interview about your discussion with Emily News, asking yes. for his information, because that was protocol, because he had to tell you what his name was. Yes. And it was almost like every movement on the pitch for a referee, there was protocol to follow with the work that you, you put uh, well, in place. Well, what I think I wanted to do was give the basic information and then allow art to come into play. Because refereeing is, it is a science, but it's also an art. It's the art of communication. You know, we, it's, what I might surprise a lot of the listeners is, is the fact that when you actually analyze communication, only 5% of it is verbal in communication with someone else. It's visual is, is, the, is the big thing, the yeah. body language. How your eyes look. Uh, your hand movements. You, as an example, if, if you're fidgeting, you're fidgeting. Yeah. And that send, can send a signal out that you're unsure about what you've done. You know, so what you've got to try to do is to say to referees, I want you now to get into the realms of being calm. And, and look calm. Look in control. Down here, the stomach's churning and the head's whizzing, but look calm. And, and the body language is that, you know, a conversation with a player in one corner is not going to be heard with the opposite corner. Yeah. So, but it can be. If you, for example, run alongside a player and have a quiet word, okay, 
you and I don't know that's a quiet word, but if I say to the referee, just give a signal, flapping the right hand, it, and that is the link that says I'm communicating with that individual. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are body language signals that come into play, movement and positioning. But I like proactive referees rather than reactive referees. And, and the proactive referee says that's where I want the throw in taken. What's the point in saying to a, a, a player who's run 10 yards down the line, get back, if you haven't told him where you want the throw in taken yeah. within reason? Yeah, yeah. In the same way, what's the point in going through the process of 10 yards and getting the wall back 10 yards and moving then out and the guy picks the ball up and moves it forward a yard? What are you going to do there? Yeah. Well, give him a yellow card. Yeah. He'll not do it again. So I think that the old, the old process of refereeing is about communication, effective communication. Um, and you hope that referees through their career will be allowed to do that. But for a young referee now, he's got to absorb a lot of information very quickly because in my day, I was being judged against what I was doing. Today's young referee runs out on the pitch at Penistone or Stocksbridge or Emily and he's being judged as always Mark Clattenburg or Howard Webb. This is the difficulty for them and of course the, the, the criticism that is, is lined at the senior referees, and I'm one that criticises, you know, publicly and in writing in the media, um, can be damaging to the young referee. I recognise that. But it's not, not a, a fallout of the success of the PGMOL, where you've raised the profile to a, a level which was the envy of the global football world, effectively, wasn't it? Where by the time yeah. you finished with the PGMOL, it, it became the global standard. Yes. Everybody sees that global standard and expects the same wherever they go. That's, that, that's true and I think that that puts a bit of a burden on, on our referees because at the moment, you know, they're not performing. They, there's, there's too many referees in that group that, that are less quality performers than the ones that I managed. And okay, if I'm going to use Howard Webb as, as uh, Uriah Rennie, as, as the one to get up to, so be it. But there are some good referees. You know, there's Bell, uh, Tony Bell in Sheffield and, and Tom Bramall, and these are young referees coming through. Darren England from Barnsley. I mean, I was asked to do a one to 20 list of referees, and I sat back this last week in the Daily Telegraph, and Darren England is new to the list. He's number three in my, in my number three or four. That's how good a referee I think he is, and I hope he's not going to be spoiled by the trappings of someone telling him to do it differently. Yeah. Because I think he's been brought up in this area and, and learned really well. I think there's some referees that, that offer potential who are not fulfilling the potential. I think that if you take Chris Cavanna, when he came onto the list, a Lancashire referee, really good decision maker, Roger Dilks, a colleague of mine that lives in Mosley, and I know him, know him, and I'm thinking this is a good choice, good selection. But all of a sudden he's got the badge, and then this is when you need a big but size 10 boot, because you've then got to have level accountability. You know, I've sat, I've sat opposite referees who, who are colleagues, who I admire, and I've said to them, you're not going to referee next week. Why? I don't like the form you're in. I want you to go away, examine your performances, work with your coach because you're not eating the standards that's expected. So if you want the world's best, and, a, and my business plan was to create a cadre of world-class referees, then it means that there's accountability at the bottom end. And, and I think the tale that we've got currently of the existing group of referees is too long. There's, there's too many referees there who are coasting. And in business, and this is where business and refereeing comes together, you know, in, in business, if you coast, as a, you don't invest, you don't improve, then what you do is regress. And that's the same in refereeing. And, and what you want to do is you want, you want people to progress. You want the standards. When I left it with world class referees, I wanted that standard to go further. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in communication almost on a daily basis now with a, with a, a guy who's now a mate, really. But I can remember, and this is what 
gives you, if you like, that global image. I can remember sat in a school in Cameroon, drawing on a white wall because they didn't, we had no AV, the AV equipment didn't work because they had no power, right? So I'm drawing on a wall and we've got a guy who's at the bit of a flash guy in the room, uh, keep asking questions and keep giving him answers, keep asking questions, keep giving answers. And before we started the following day, we started playing Elvis Presley re records. And he got up and started mimicking Elvis. So we called him Elvis. We gave him his name, Elvis. He's, he, it was Nupu, Nupu, whatever his name. Elvis had come from a village. He had no idea of refereeing. He, he liked to play football. And, and I had to say to him, Elvis, either you referee or you play football. You can't do both. You've got to, you've got to concentrate. And Elvis concentrated on his refereeing. And, and you know, this week, and last week, he's been running out in Cameroon on the Af African Nations tournament as, a, as an assistant referee. And I take great pride in that because he, he's listened, he still seeks advice, he seeks advice from other referees around the world in order that he wants to improve the standard, but he's raising the standards of, of Cameroon officials, which is, which is important. And here again, here's a guy who speaks fluent French because that's what they do in Cameroon, mm. and I don't. But we communicated with each other to say clearly what is required. I think that the changes that, uh, the new guy who came in at the time I left, and I left to become the referee ambassador for the Premier League, knowing full well that I'd be traveling the world, and by A, I mean traveling the world, Asia, South America, Africa, and into Europe on, a, on a, almost a weekly basis. So much so, after two years, I'd had enough of sitting <laughs> on aeroplanes yeah. and gave it in. But th the reality is that uh, you see how other countries have to work to get into refereeing. And sometimes I feel that they don't respect the fact that they've been made professional enough. It's almost like I'm earning the money, so what? When in fact, you always want to do your best, whatever level that you're refereeing at. And I think some of them, not all, but some have lost that attachment with the game at grassroots level. You know, I look at Howard Webb, I look at Uriah Rennie. They were two referees that were again, top of the list, international referees from this area who continued to referee at grassroots level. Who, who, you know, I can remember my grandson Sam coming home one day and saying, uh, we've had a referee who, um, who wants to be known to you. And I've gone, go on, what do you call him? Uh, Howard, uh, and I've gone, Howard Webb. And he goes, yeah. And so for Sam, Howard Webb didn't mean much at that particular yeah, yeah. time. But all of a sudden you're going, Howard, I rang Howard up and said, yeah. you refereed my grandson today. Amazing that you've done a school game. Yeah, it was better than training. You've retired from the PGMOL. You've got another story to tell about life in retirement, but not, not for this programme, but mm. for now. Thank you very much for the story. Very Pleasure. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.